uh, good afternoon and welcome back. I know it's, it's, it's getting to a very, uh, those particular who's joined us from the morning, it is, uh, I know it's, it's tiring, but uh, hopefully we will get through this very soon. Now, welcome to the four, this is session four. We still got session five. And this session four, as I said earlier before the break, uh, is going to be chaired by uh, May Idris from UCL. She's one of the smartest, uh, if I call you May without hesitation, one of the smartest, intelligent young girls. Uh, she's, she always excelled in her uh, everything. Degree, masters, uh, she's at UCL now doing policy, her PhD in policy, one of the best centers in public policy but she also got engineering and, and, and public health uh, backgrounds. We got three speakers, so I will hand over May. As we agreed, each moderator in the past is up to you, whether you take question after each speaker or if you put them all together after we, they all finish, uh, it's up to you. You will have the question from the floor and I will also supply you with any question or selection of questions from the Facebook. Dr. Wild, he keep comes in and out because he's currently in the hospital. He's working today. He got his uh, presentation, he recorded it. Mervyn said it's, it's fine, so we will see. I mean, uh, he's the second speaker, but I would suggest if we have any problem with, uh, he's very keen to speak to you from the hospital, from Cambridge, but I would suggest uh, uh, if he definitely keen to join and he can find the time, you just go on. I will update you on the message, okay? okay. So the floor is yours, May, go ahead. Thank you, Professor Alam, and lovely to see uh, so many participants. Uh, thank you for joining uh, session four of the WASAD online learning conference. Uh, so as Professor Alam said, my name is Maimana I'm Idris. I'm very pleased to be moderating uh, this session and I'm going to introduce our first speakers. Uh, I say speakers because they're from uh, the same institute. Uh, we have Gabriella Nassar, who is the director of the Instituto Malores Gias in Brazil, and Dr. Joyce Capelli, I hope I said that right, who is the president of the Instituto Malores Gias. Uh, they will be speaking about providing better nutrition and food security during the pandemic. Uh, in Brazil. So uh, Gabriela and Joycey, if you would like to introduce your topic and start your presentation. Thank you. And I will take questions at the end. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Mai, uh, for your, if I call it, for the introduction. I will share my screen now. Just a minute. Hope you can all see it. Yes, okay, good. Um, so thank you again, as I said, for the introduction. Good afternoon to all participants. Hello to all those that are uh, accompanying the conference from all over the world. It's a pleasure to be here and contribute to this discussion about innovation, technology, and sustainability, and represent a civil society organization among uh, these higher institutions present here. Um, we bring here to you today the results of a study developed by the Brazilian nonprofit Instituto Melhores Dias on the effects of the pandemic on the food security of families in Brazil, as well as proposed interventions to alleviate this current scenario. Uh, first of all, I would like to briefly introduce the Instituto. It's a fully registered Brazilian nonprofit organization that has for the past 25 years contributed to the improvement of health, education, and well-being of children in several communities throughout the country. One of the main pillars of our mission and vision is that development comes with partnerships. It is necessary to work together with several instances, public, private, grassroots level, in order to achieve a positive outcome in sustainable development. We're also part of the Global Compact which is a network of initiatives that work in accordance to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And present with me here today is Dr. Joyce Capelli. She's president of the Instituto, or IMD as we call it. And we are happy to share some of our work with you. Uh, so the COVID-19 pandemic has had a clear effect worldwide. This has been intensely debated in the past months. 
A troubling factor about the effects of the pandemic in Brazil, not only there, of course, is that it has brought forth a fragility and vulnerability in terms of food security, health and well-being, which go far beyond the 5.3 million recorded COVID cases. At the end of 2019, Brazil's working force was 40% informal and 16.2 million were unemployed. And aggravating the scenario, 85 million Brazilians had homes with some degree of food insecurity, of which 10 million suffered of severe food insecurity. Hunger is unfortunately once more growing in Brazil, despite successful efforts done in the early 2000s to remove Brazil from the world hunger map. Concomitant to the scenario, we have a current government in Brazil that is dismantling important institutions that were created in recent years to help change this reality. Now, when looking uh, specifically at the malnutrition data in the country, 20% of the adult population suffers from obesity. In assessments done by the IMD Institute with school-aged children, an average of 14% uh, of them are overweight or obese. This map uh, with recent data demonstrates how Brazil is facing the double burden of malnutrition with high levels of overweight and obesity alongside iron deficiency anemia. Levels of anemia in children are as high as 55% in some areas of the country, which also show extreme inequalities internally that we find. So the actual extent of the effects of the pandemic in food security and hunger are difficult to assess at the moment and predict in the near future. Although it all indicates to an inflation of this current scenario of fragility and vulnerability. This aligned with a political agenda that does not prioritize nutrition, social environmental policies and a family agriculture creates an unstable environment prone to degradation, hunger, and further deepening crisis. So we developed um, an online assessment with the objective to detect the current impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the food security of families in Brazil and provide possible local solutions to alleviate the current scenario. And now we share some of the results we found. In terms of economic impact, 64% of the families had their income decreased after the beginning of the pandemic. And 37% of them are not working. And one in five of these families have no one in the household working as well. One main striking result is that 10% of the families currently don't have access to the food that they need. If we look regionally, uh, local inequalities again are aggravated and we have 18% suffering from food insecurity in the Northeast region, for example. 17% affirmed that their feeding practices got worse after the onset of the health crisis, and 12% stopped eating fruits and vegetables. The school meal is also being missed by a majority of the families. And in terms of health, 23% of the respondents mentioned they suffer from a non-communicable disease and two in five families had someone in the household with a chronic condition. Now these results demonstrate the urgency to implement long-term behavior change interventions for the population since they are at risk of developing further complications worsened by the inadequate eating habits. Our experience shows that governments cannot address these multi-level factors by themselves. Therefore, civil society organizations have an important role to play, not only advocating for policy change, but delivering information and assistance to communities at a local grassroots level. Uh, so after schools were closed in Brazil in early 2020, because of the pandemic and kids and families, as well as the teachers had to stay home, it became evident that new strategies needed to be urgently put in place. A new challenge was present, which was how to reach families without internet, without access to technologies. Uh, some of these things were brought up uh, here today, you know, the difficulties that many countries are facing in terms of how 
to deal with the, the lack of resources and internet access. And Brazil is a very unequal country with each state having different socioeconomic and technological scenarios. So it's imperative to adapt and try to reach as best as possible those families that have no uh, connection or unstable internet connection in order to bring information and continuous learning. We want to pay a tribute to all teachers in Brazil, as well as all over the world, uh, who have during this difficult time dedicated themselves to changing their teaching methods, going beyond their usual experiences to reach the students. So the IMD Institute, after the pandemic, started reaching out to schools and teachers directly with education and health promotion, providing trainings and classes in different topics to ensure uh, we continued our goal of local capacity building. And we provided as well printed materials and digital activities because depending on where uh, we were working, the scenario is different. We assess that the majority of teachers use WhatsApp to send activities to children and families because families sometimes, even if they don't have a stable internet connection with WhatsApp, they can uh, use you know, local uh, phone lines. And despite challenges and local difficulties, we have had results in terms of family engagement and willingness to work with topics related to health, nutrition, and sustainability. These are some pictures of the trainings we developed. And now I also bring some photos of um, activities developed at home by the families with the input of teachers in some of the places we have projects. And as you can see, there's a strong focus on gardening and nutrition, as we learned that a home garden can not only supply vegetables, but instigate children and families to eat healthier. This is an effort to address that figure we mentioned earlier, that 12% of the families currently don't have the resources to buy fresh foods. And I would like to conclude by saying that overweight and obesity cannot be addressed in isolation. It is necessary to develop alternatives that are engaging and multidimensional in order to address all the factors influencing these issues. With local stakeholder involvement and capacity building, the objective is to create a grassroots network of relationships between schools, health units, local leaders, and families, so they look for alternatives that suit their own local needs. The COVID-19 pandemic has evidenced that solutions to health, environmental, economic, social issues can only be addressed in a collective effort with successful and dedicated partnerships. As Professor Ellen uh, addressed earlier this morning, uh, let's not forget we're all fighting together. And the coming months and even years are crucial for governments, institutions, and civil society organizations to observe and intervene in order to avoid a possible increase of epidemic proportion on the rates of childhood obesity, undernutrition in children, which will bring about an even higher death rate due to non-communicable diseases in the future. So um, this is what we wanted to share. Dr. Joyce, if you want to add anything or we're open to questions. Yes, I just want to thank you. A beautiful presentation Gabriela has put together and uh, the, the education definitely is what will change the world in the future you know we all are, are bounded by education and it perpasses is you know it's entangled in all um, areas of life so our stress is that uh, education reaches the, the, the population and uh, we are struggling as they are in <clears throat> india and in other countries or access to internet and uh, making sure that the communities are reached. Thank you, Gabriela, and thank you for the opportunity to present the study here at this conference. Yes, we are ready for questions. <laughs> thank you, um, Gabriela and Dr. Joycey. Uh, really uh, informative uh, 
presentation, uh, Gabriella, um, uh, you know, with interesting interventions um, and uh, policy solutions. Um, and not just in education, but obviously in, in online education, but also in health and in nutrition. So thank you for that. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes, thank you. It's a very excellent presentation. I uh, particularly uh, got inspired when we think about uh, children nutrition and how that is very central to their learning. And also that uh, the role of NGOs is very important. And I wanted to find out how strong are your NGOs and capacitated to uh, help you to have a strong voice. Brazil has gone through a lot in this past uh, 30 years. And uh, we did have <clears throat> with the prior governments a more intense effort to give voice to the nonprofits. Unfortunately, right now we are not in a, in a very good space, but uh, our organization is almost 30 years old. So we have, um, dur back during these years, uh, really uh, gotten into good partnerships with not only with the local governments, but with um, several uh, companies and, and foundations, not only from Brazil, but from overseas. So that give us a, a a good uh, starting point, but you are right, you know, uh, the nonprofits should uh, stay together more and, and have a, a louder voice because uh, the government cannot really supply all, all what the communities need. And so there's a, a strong need that the, the, the grassroots, that the, the nonprofits, along with the government and along with uh, the companies, work together, as Gabriela said, about the partnerships. Gabriela, please, uh, would you like to Yeah, add? I just wanted to add to what you're saying, Joyce, that uh, Professor Mambella, you're right. I think NGOs, it varies a lot between international nonprofits and local nonprofits. We still see that there is this gap that would need to empower and provide more resources and trainings to local NGOs. So they can, as you say, you know, build on local capacities. Um, it's a very uh, unequal um, scenario, but I think as other institutions as well, you have that in, you know, higher education institutions as well, there's this difference. But, um, you know, the past years, nonprofits and NGOs have gained uh, strength and they have, uh, you know, built networks to uh, to implement good projects, and we see on the ground, um, you know, good um, results. Yes, it's a dense work. But, yeah, but, it, but you know, we see that uh, one day we'll, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, what what we can see is that the, the, this really really big no uh, international nonprofits sometimes a lot of the, 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 the support that comes from the companies is stay at a, a headquarters level and not everything reaches the, you know, the, real, the real community, yeah. the, the ones that really need it. And that's something that, unfortunately, there, there's not many transparency and tools for us to look into that and uh, change it. But... Um, it's, Thank you. Yeah. We are all doing what we can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the question and for the answers as well. Do we have any other questions? Okay, I, I actually have a question. Um, it's regarding, uh, you said your results and collecting those results. I just want to know because um, I'm very much an advocate of a systematic approach um, to dealing with any policy challenge or issue. And uh, what has been sort of the, the, the difficulty in getting the data? I know you spoke about it at the beginning of your presentation. Um, 
and what were sort of the surprise um, outcomes with working, for example, with a um, civil society, um, because a lot of stakeholders do have conflicting, if, you know, you spoke about the local government, they do sometimes have conflicting um, sort of uh, goals or aims. So getting that data, getting them on board, uh, how did you overcome the challenges and were there any um, good uh, things to come out of it? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. We, we actually, when um, specifically for this one, uh, it was a surprise to us because this is one of the limitations, of course, is we are not, we're reaching the ones that we're able to answer because it was an online survey. So we send out to families that, uh, but we're surprised to the responses as well. We had almost uh, 1,500 uh, families and um, if we had extended the time, we might have had more, which I think is surprising, but still we don't reach those that weren't able to, um, you know, respond in terms of internet. But on our daily work, as you said, you know, the data we gather, the height and weight and anemia and all this that we develop in our programs, actually, when we show the governments, you know, the work that we're doing in terms of public health, and how important it is, what is the current scenario? Because sometimes, well, most of the times, uh, when we arrive in a, in a town, we know that education and health don't talk so much and uh, other entities, you know, local entities don't as well. And we try to bring them together and say, you know, interventions for uh, health education have to combine, you know, the local health post, the school. So, um, we actually uh, gathered this data in partnership with the schools and the local governments. Um, we have rarely encountered uh, situations where we have demonstrated the data and they said, no, that that's not correct. But, and we know that that's a reality. Uh, but really, uh, most of the times when we collect the data and show um, our work is really to, in the long term, as you're saying, um, you know, have some interventions become um, public policies. As for example, if for a few years, we have studied that iron deficiency anemia is a real issue in school age children. And uh, providing, you know, iron supplementation is not uh, an expensive uh, solution. And we include that in our programs. And we've been saying that for a long time that it could become a public policy in a few years to turn around this scenario. So I think um, as we're pointing out, it's something that you have to um, you know, show the data, keep showing. And um, well, in terms of challenges, we don't, uh, we haven't encountered challenges in terms of uh, demonstrating what we have found uh, because we, from the start, have them on board, you know, the schools, the, 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 the teachers, the local health um, departments. I hope it answers, Joyce, if you want to add anything. I think it's exactly it. Although the Fed, at the federal level, there is a, um, they say that they should, for instance, uh, supply iron sulfate for the children at a local level, they decide they don't. So there is not a, a, a good conversation between local government and federal level. And that's something that uh, impacts on the population. So what we have found that uh, if we work closely with the local government, sometimes it is easier to get results because it, you are closer to them than uh, at the, the, the government or the, at the federal level. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Um, <laughs> lots of issues with um, sharing data and knowledge across um, different uh, government bodies and especially with the local community and the local government and then the national government. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your interesting presentation and for answering our questions. We will go to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Wael Bashari. Is he with us?
and uh, my other, I, I just text him to see whether he is available now, he can join or not. So I recommend we go with Professor Farida and I will update you on the message if I know anything. We have the video, but let's see. He tried a couple of times from the world. He said the internet is very difficult. So this can also tell you about the discussion we had earlier about the internet connectivity in Africa. Here we're talking about Cambridge University Hospital. So, uh, and they are struggling with the internet. So <laughs> it's a global problem. Yes. So I think you should go ahead with Professor Farida. Okay, um, so I'll introduce uh, Professor Farida Fortune. Uh, she is the Professor uh, of Medicine in relation to oral health and was head of the Center for Clinical and Diagnostic Oral Sciences at Queen Mary University in London. Um, she will be speaking about health perspectives and opportunities for developing countries. Uh, Prof Fortune, if you would like to introduce your topic and start your presentation, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Ellen, for asking me. I've had a, a most wonderful day so far, listening to everyone, and learned a huge amount. Uh, my name is Frida Fortune. I'm both uh, I'm what's called a clinical academic, which means uh, that I uh, teach as well as do clinical work. So my university has been using online uh, teaching for some time and over the summer I just formalized it all uh, as well as uh, using quite a lot of video conferencing. I also use some AI for my research to identify novel uh, protein molecules and um, the other thing was that uh, I also run clinical sessions and I've been working all through COVID and I do appreciate that uh, the people with transferable skills were the people who were most important in uh, supporting uh, the COVID uh, initiative. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, global health uh, perspective online learning in uh, developing countries, but really it's about global solutions but actually uh, local uh, delivery. And the huge opportunities for doing all of this, as well as huge risk, which should not be underestimated. And we have to always keep in mind that we who um, are in charge or run programs, uh, never to assume that we know the best, but we should be able to live, deliver the best. And my, my huge thing is uh, communities. And we must not forget communities wherever we are, whether we're in London or whether we're uh, in Africa or Asia or uh, at Brazil, which I love and which you do a great job. Uh, so I'm sure everyone knows this, this internet distribution. I simply wanted to show it to show the uh, inequality of it and that 50% of all the users of the 4 point about 6 billion now uh, people who use the internet are in Asia. So China has over 1 billion users and then India, Malaysia, Japan, South Korea, huge amount, North Korea, no one. Um, and uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, so all very big users of the internet and have moved forward with internet usage at, within their populations. Europe as well, their penetration is high, over 90%, and North America. Then when you come to the rest of the world, we seem to have problems. And it's a bit concerning that we're providing huge solutions who are amazing to people who don't have any access. And in uh, 2013, I um, developed a, a process where we could be working in health and education uh, to work with local communities anywhere 
uh, in the world, but mainly with disadvantaged groups um, to uh, provide solutions that they wanted and they needed and that we would uh, put in place. So we've run uh, programs all over the world and as I say, mainly in uh, 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 the developing uh, countries. Because this is the big thing, you know, you, if you don't have clean water, you don't have education, you don't have health, and you don't actually have access to any of the things we were talking about today. Uh, so how do we work with these communities, not from what we think they need, but what they tell us they need and to empower them? Because if you look at the sustainable goals for these groups, okay, we are not going to do anything. And I like the slide earlier, which showed uh, this poverty inequality around all the uh, characteristics of the SDGs are not available. But if you give people health and education, you empower them and you motivate them. And I think the most important thing we are all going to need going forward is resilience. You need to build that resilience. And I'm not quite sure in some of our methodology where uh, soft skills are not going to be so important, are we going to build resilience in our communities? One size doesn't fit all. You have to provide what uh, works for a particular community. But my big thing is localism. You know, you help with a strategy, you help setting the objectives, but this comes from the local community. And you have to be important, uh, uh, aware of the environment you are working in uh, and, and so that you can make sure whatever project you do, ever help you do, it works. And I know there's quite a lot of educational pedagogy, but actually, basically, for people like me, um, we learn really from what we see, how we interact with people, what we do, and what we listen to. So those things are, are really important and should continue. I don't mind what you call it, if it's blended, but you have to have a pragmatic approach. Take the best of what you have from where you are, get your group to define what they need and want locally, make sure like the Brazil group who've done a fantastic job that you've got something to evidence it and then uh, work. So we work with, so we're working together, a group of like-minded individuals, um, a lot of us are uh, academics, uh, diaspora, um, and uh, other people who are not in the academic environment, uh, and we work with local NGOs, all right? So although we work through the universities, the hospitals, with the local uh, um, uh, countries, actually it's the local NGOs who make the difference. And every project where we've succeeded was the local groups uh, who are nimble, they can respond quickly because they know what is needed. And I always say, if you're gonna be successful at anything, at the end of it, you have to stand away, walk away and know the knowledge, the skills and the leadership is with the local people, no longer with you. So I have this, we can do, I can do, we can do mentality you know i know in africa besides the electricity besides you know no money going into the important areas that they should that people are hugely resilient and actually you know there's no broadband coverage um people don't have money for that the only thing that everyone has in africa is a cheap mobile phone okay so you use that and actually there's gps so you take a mobile broadband and you take it on a car, you can take it on a donkey and you can take it anywhere. You take it into the local university and you can take it into the local school. Actually, you don't need to be separated 
community is very, very important. If you're out in the open, in the felt, okay, you don't have to sit next to each other and you have broadband, but afterwards everyone can discuss and you still have the community and the interchangeable uh, learning. And this has worked very well. Uh, we've um, uploaded programs from London. They've taken down by uh, schools or universities and uh, using them for teaching. Uh, we also use this when there's an operation and they need high level expertise to guide them through uh, uh, operations where they don't have the money to take the patient out of country. Uh, that works well. So this is cheap, movable and easy to use. Right. And yeah, this is children who are heads of families or a parent have died. And so they don't get a chance to go to school, let alone have a computer. Um, so you can do exactly the same. They're taken away over weekend and they have uh, their education. And then you use all the forms of learning to try and embed in these children, build them with a sense of pride and, uh, and proud of what they do and use the skills of their mothering and fathering and bring that as a, a learning to the group. And when they're older, quite a few of these children have managed to get through school, managed to get through university. They then learn their other skills. This is my favorite slide. Okay. These two young children are under the age of 10. Okay. Look what they've done. They've got almost nothing, even to the marbles that they're using are the correct size to play pool. Now, this is a huge amount of learning that has gone into this. And these children have elementary school and that's all. And I wonder if you see the King's Fund uh, article, um, uh, last year, that's Independent Research Fund, called, saying London Calling, saying, why are we in our hospitals dependent on staff who comes from the low and medium uh, economic countries? Why do we have such a lot of international recruitment of health workers? Okay. And why is there such competition? America, Canada, Europe, UK, Australia, all want the staff. And in COVID-19, if you ask anyone, most of the staff in hospital who died were the black and ethnic minority groups, which a lot of them came from these countries. But actually it's telling you a story that they have skills, okay, which are needed. So don't forget when we are going and doing massive online learning, I'm not against it because I do it myself, but I think the transferable skills are hugely, hugely important. So just a bit about localism. We learned a huge amount with Ebola when people were dying. And we found out actually nobody could understand the 110 page WHO guidance book. So we took it, turned it into 10 pages, all pictures, and everyone in the group had to send it. We sent it to churches, mosques, schools, local community groups, football clubs, uh, and pinged it into uh, the countries. And people actually said they understood. Somebody told me from uh, New York uh, hospital, it's the first time I understand the guidance. So with COVID-19, we did exactly the same. We made really easy to understand manuals, which you could pull, pull a page out and pin it on a, a clinic wall uh, with a lot of guidance. And we made a waterless soap and then realized, actually we couldn't send it in country. So because we have this really large uh, network, we gave uh, the recipe, the formula, to so that they could use it. 
and it could be made and it had to be distributed uh, free. Uh, and I think that's really important. So I'm very keen, okay, that we reduce inequality. And, and, and it's there, all right, we have to do this. But at the moment, it isn't happening. We're in the middle of wherever we are. And so you have to adapt and deliver. You've got to continuously engage your partners. And locally, they have to be active partners that you keep on talking to, where you know what they need and want, and build capacity. And this capacity about data collection is that really, you know what needs to be delivered. I'm not keen on uh, collecting personal data, uh, as uh, I do my learning at night and I found out that actually, every time I was doing some medical educational learning, uh, the data about me was picked up because I didn't do anything for about two weeks and the message came and said, uh, this is your new learning, we haven't seen you. <laughs> this data that I think we should collect is data that tells you what the needs are, so it can help you uh, deliver. And really never believe that a few caring people can't change the world because that's all <laughs> we ever have. And so thank you, Professor Allen who's the most caring person and who's made such a difference over this last year and during COVID, keeping all of this going. And this large groups across the world, we've all learned loads and loads from each other. And I think your legacy is that a lot of us join up because we all have the same ethos of delivering. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Fortune. Uh, really, again, uh, invigorating and interesting topic. Um, I really particularly enjoyed the, the story of localism and how actually we can have this knowledge transfer from Africa and developing countries um, and how we can learn transferable skills. And really, there are, there is an element of frugal innovation. I don't like the term reverse innovation, so I will go with frugal innovation. Um, and that we can we can learn so much, especially with um, education and health. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. And um, I would like to open up to questions, please. Um, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation, Professor Freida. I have a, a quick question if you uh, actually wanted to, uh, if you could stand a bit more when you say about um, uh, the capacity building for data collection and because something this is um, we nonprofits talk a lot about um, and how this can be then uh, transferred or dialogue to for example um, the scientific uh, university world because still I think there is this um, I wouldn't say gap, but um, uh, the data collected by uh, nonprofits that are usually used in program development or, as my mentioned, you know, policy uh, making, uh, it still is not uh, seen or regarded the same as um, knowledge created by, you know, universities or the scientific uh, community. If you could. Yes. A little about yes, and I mean, uh, that's uh, very important. If I give you an analogy in medicine, that we have something now called patient reported outcomes. Previously, we only had physician reported outcomes and all uh, policy was made on that. Um, I run a rare disease and we really need to have patient reported outcomes. I moved my focus to the patient reported data. And that data has become so powerful because it not only tells you about things like uh, diet, health, education, um, 
all uh, uh, symptoms, drugs, if what you're using is inappropriate or not. Uh, and it's only when you start using that data. So with our programs, uh, the reason why we've kept it so local is we always have a very strong governance structure around a data. So I haven't shown you that because we haven't had enough time. And Prof. Alam always says I talk too much. <laughs> so, um, and so we have a strong governance uh, uh, around the whole project. So as soon as we start working with the group, we will put all the data that they, okay, uh, want uh, included. So that's taken in first and then working together to put the project together and the data then that comes out from them again. And so the, the data collection is really uh, important. And then is once you have data about people, they should know exactly what data you have and that data is fed back to them or they always able to see it, right? And then the other data that you hold, um, you keep on adding to it. So I, if you'd gone back to uh, the model that was set up, you'll see that wherever the data comes from, there's a central data bank. And we have somebody whose sole expertise is uh, data collection, data security, and uh, making sure that if you have data from someone, um, that they are aware of what the data is. We never collect uh, 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 the sort of data that tells you about people's habits or what they're doing, so private uh, uh, data. But we'll have a really good outcomes data of uh, the needs, the requirements, and really how you uh, input into ongoing uh, uh, with your project. And that's why we always know, that's how we found out that people actually couldn't understand what they were telling them to do. With Ebola, everyone thought it's because they kept on washing the bodies after they had died. But what they were saying to us, actually, we don't know what they're asking us to do. These, the paperwork, is so um, long, so big, right? And everyone makes an assumption, oh, people, because they're poor, they can't read. You know, there's a whole load of assumptions around people, but actually it wasn't that, is this document was totally incomprehensible. So, and that was actually this people reported data, as opposed to us saying, we want this data or that data from you. Yeah. Thanks. Great. But it's important to set it up and have it centralized and have a good governance structure around it. Yes, I think that's the biggest challenge. Centralizing it, sharing it or finding platforms to share the data yeah. and the research. Um, I think a lot of NGOs struggle with that, a lot of um, education institutes as well. I think it's because the, the, the other thing, it, it's this, the way people think about data, they think that if they have put it in from a higher organization, it's of importance, but this data down here isn't. But without this data, you actually can't move forward. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we always make sure that in-country data stays in country, all right? So if you from say uh, Botswana, Malawi, whatever, that's your data, you keep the data, right? We, we will pull towards the center, okay? But you will know everything that we see and people don't see other people's data. So you're from another country, okay? So you're from Kenya, you see the Kenyan data, uh, not the uh, Malawian data. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and surprisingly, um, what I found in my research is that a lot of the issues are shared. So a lot of issues are transboundary. Um, I, you know, I did a, a bit of research into climate change and, and, you know, we all face similar issues. So sharing the data would be so 
useful across um, countries, especially countries um, within, con uh, you know, country, neighbouring countries. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, thank, thank you. Did you want to add something? I'm so sorry. No, I just want to go into saying, um, I was listening to Prof uh, uh, Marabello this morning and thinking, you know, that's the same where I come from. <laughs> so I think it's all shared. We all have the same frustration, but actually it's to find a pathway under all of that, that you can still be effective. Thank you so much. And a, um, a great comment to end on. Um, so we unfortunately can't uh, speak to Dr. Bashari. Uh, we will play his um, presentation in the break. So Prof. Alam, do you want to um, tell me if, so, if we can take a break Yes, uh, Dr. Wail, uh, he's, at, at, he's in, in, in clinic now or he's in actually the, uh, he's, he's, a, he's, he's in a high level Arab. I mean, the doctors will know where he is now, but he said he's in the ward now. He tried to, to still join us, but he sent this early morning, three o'clock in the morning, his video of his talk, I think seven, eight minutes, but I communicated with him in the last five, 10 minutes. And he said he would love for us to show his video. And he said that he checked the connectivity. He can't answer question on the chat. So he cannot appear. I think the connection is not strong enough in the world for him to appear in video, but he can answer question. So what I'm suggesting, we play his video. Mervin assured me he can play it now. And then we listen to his talk. I see it's seven or eight minutes. And then please write your questions to me. Then we can forward this to him and he, or he can join the chat and he will answer you. So he promised he will answer. He's in the hospital now. We really appreciate it. And this is, what kept us all really moving? Because uh, Frida is very, very busy. From the morning until 8, 9 p.m. You can just see now, Bushari, those, uh, what's his name, Rawat, he came earlier, he's teaching at 2 o'clock. All of you, uh, I really appreciate your time. And this is, I think, the beauty of uh, getting, like Farida said, the like-minded people. Uh, every one of you sacrifices time. Everyone, I can see that from all of you. Uh, so let's play his video. Mervin, uh, and then please write your question because he can answer it, he said immediately, from his hospital in Cambridge. But uh, he said, he I, I have seen him try it many times to come on board. He might succeed, I don't know. Maybe suddenly the internet will be stronger. Now, and I think Marabella and uh, Joseph in the morning from Uganda, you can see we also struggle here sometimes. Now, uh, Mervin, can we watch his uh, lecture? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honour to have been invited to present to you this session today on patient education, capitalising on the use of telemedicine technologies during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Wal Bashari. I am a consultant endocrinologist in Cambridge University Hospital. My clinical work involves mainly looking after patients with tumours affecting various endocrine glands in the body have nothing to disclose. I do apologise for having to start with presenting to you some death data addressing mortality not related to COVID-19 during the initial phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. This graph shows a significant excess in the non-COVID death registration in England and Wales in the period between the months of March and May 2020. This unfortunate finding denotes the difficulties that healthcare sectors have faced and is still having to face during this pandemic, not only related to patients affected by this virus itself, but also including patients presenting with other conditions, having had to delay their presentation to hospital and or follow up in hospitals due to challenges related to lockdown, etc. As a result of this phenomenon, the healthcare sector around the world have been pushed into the sudden future phenomenon, which amongst several other implementations involve the employment of telemedicine technologies and the application of distant virtual healthcare to fill the inevitable gap that um, have been unearthed in the medical practice. 
It is therefore prudent that the current generation patient should possess the ability to be able to adapt to such changes in order to benefit from the current methods used in delivery of care. I will now show you an example in a form of a clinical vignette of a patient who was assessed for an uncovered yet still a significant health problem using telemedicine technology. This is a 20 year old man who presented to his local doctor with progressive visual deterioration over a period of many many months. Several causes have been implicated and he received several forms of treatment without improvement. This summative grayscale graphic shows an imitation of his visual ability in both the left and the right eye, with the solid black areas denoting complete absence of vision. Understandably, this young man was drastically disabled as a result of his near complete blindness. He was assessed by our team in collaboration with his local team um, uh, back in Khartoum in Sudan. Subsequently, we have confirmed that he has a large brain tumour affecting his pituitary gland, which is basically the main endocrine gland located in, at the centre of the brain. Treatment of such complex tumours would require detailed discussion with the patient and a great deal of understanding of all the implications that are associated with offering any form of therapy. We managed to use all the technology available to hand in order to accurately deliver clinical consultation and patient education. This 3D rendered model is a product of this patient's different skull and brain imaging modalities all fused together. Through teleconsultation, we have managed to communicate our information delivery and management plans with this patient with a reasonable outcome. We were able to share this and other imaging and graphic and written information with the patient whilst he was sitting at home browsing through his smartphone. Such and with good understanding of all the possible outcomes, we managed to start him on a form of medical therapy with tablets taken twice per week in an in attempts to shrink this tumour. Few months down the line, his vision has started to improve and a blood test for his tumour marker had dropped down significantly as shown in this graph on the right hand side. As a result, his tumour has significantly shrunk with, um, as, as seen as observed on, on the repeat magnetic resonance imaging on the right column here compared to the original scan which is here on the left side. This slide shows an example of the written information leaflets that we crafted uh, for this gentleman in particular to use as a guide. It provides room to increase patient empowerment in order to allow the patient to be thoroughly involved and well educated in their disease, which needless to say helps during the COVID-19 pandemic where face-to-face -face consultations have been extremely limited. We have managed to publish this case as, as a case report showing, a, showing the application of telemedicine technology in treating such complex tumours which to our knowledge is the first telemedicine approach ever used in this disease category. This management outcome would not have been possible without the effective virtual patient education that we've implemented for this patient. As a result, we have now established a virtual service involving a variety of medical personnel to allow the delivery of such specialist service during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Patient engagement and education represents a cornerstone in the success of such a consultation. This diagram starts with the encouragement to identify the correct patient for such service. We must acknowledge 
that the delivery of this technology may not be appropriate for a certain uh, sector of patients. However, with more education, we can include more patients who may be able to benefit from such an approach in this new world with COVID-19 pandemic and further lockdown looming in the horizon. Thank you for listening. Um, in the meantime, we yes. do have uh, a question, uh, I assume to Professor Farida. Uh, I'll read it out. Thank you, Professor. The issue of health professionals from poor countries migrating to developing countries to provide health care to rich countries is paining. How can we provide decent pay to attract them back to help the most vulnerable and needy people in Africa? Professor Farida? Um, yes, this is a huge problem. Um, I've just replied that amazingly, without having IT training, but actually having good traditional maths in Africa, that most of the people in London for the big banks and big organizations are IT technicians that have come from Africa. So minimal learning, come in, able to work at a very high level. I think this is a huge problem. Um, if you look at uh, one of the African countries where they haven't paid the doctors or the nurses for over a year, can you blame those people for their migrating? And what a lot of countries uh, or the LMCs don't realize that their teachers and the people in health, the nurses, uh, the technicians, the doctors are really their most precious asset. And frequently people leave, not because they want to, they leave for economic reasons. Uh, and I think that's a real shame because, you know, you're just producing this wonderful uh, asset and then it goes. And so that's why I think it's really so important that we work with uh, diaspora over here to just try and give back. But I think that that's, that still doesn't uh, um, beg the question uh, of why. I mean, and it's, to be quite honest, it's, it's the UK, it's America, it's Canada. They go and recruit. Uh, and I think it's a huge ethical problem that people should sit back and think about, which they don't. Really. But, you know, but if you're not paying people, how can they live? They've got families and they and if somebody's going to ask them to to go and we'll pay you and have a reasonable life for your children and have enough money to send back home that's what's going to happen which is a problem i don't know but i think that um the governments from the very rich countries should also think very carefully when they go and recruit people. You know, um, I know everyone in health is important, but actually the health of people from the lower need and economic countries are even more important, I would say, because we still have access to healthcare and they have access to none. And if you look at most of these, countries, you know, the, the, the medicine that has been put in place, almost all of it is by NGOs. I, I want to ask as well, is it just the financial incentive that draws these people out? I also feel the level of education and access to resources, educational resources, um, medical facilities is also um it's also a massive issue that you know people want to learn what are the sort of groundbreaking new developments in their area and they're not getting access to that so i think that's another issue you know if that was streamlined yeah and improved, I think. But, but we could do that you know that we could help upskill patients i gave an example 
Uh, they were going to uh, separate Siamese twins, hadn't done the operation before. And so the surgeons, yeah, um, spoke to them, planned it with them, and then gave, had the broadband and gave access. So I think we could do quite a lot from here. And I think the one advantage of the online learning is, is that it's opening uh, postgraduate training. However, it's not without expense. So if you look at all these Moodle courses or run by the big universities uh, in Europe and in America, they're extremely expensive. And what they don't realize is that the people in the developing countries, you know, that's more than two uh, years worth of pay. So, so we uh, have to, through an NGO, uh, supply that gap. And I think, you know, of all the people that are here, we, we have those skills and that's, that's where the sharing should be. And if we do that, then people will not need to come here. I mean, we set up, you know, we worked to set up a, a dental school and there was only four people doing it. And then within five years, people qualified got on the international register. They came here to do exams, but I, there's only four people out of that first uh, lot of 20 who never went back. So I think it's really important if you can provide and it's in-house, then people, people always stay where they trained, right? If you take them out and train them elsewhere, chances are they won't go back. But if you train them, you know, in their local environment, they will stay. Thank you. Um, thank you for that point and thank you for the question. Um, I don't seem to have received any more questions for Dr. Rashari, so I will close the session. Thank you to all the speakers. It was a pleasure um, hearing you and listening to your topics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should give them all a big bow, particularly they have provided excellent uh, presentations. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, Joyce, Gabriella, uh, Farida, and also while from the, the hospital. So please remember, if we all help and do a little bit, it will make a big difference.